met a, 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 a more believing group of women than the widows in Kenya. These ladies know the Bible. And I w went there and met about 30 of them. They meet in this little compound, the, many of whose husbands were died in some of the civil wars they had in Kenya. And they meet in this compound, and the lady that runs it, you know, teaches the Bible every, actually every day. They teach the Bible there. I remember when Bishop Bryan said we're going over the widow's compound up in the, in the mountains of, El, of uh, El Doret. We had stopped by, he said, we're going to pick up some maize. I said, oh, maize? Why are you going to get maize? I didn't understand that. Why are you going to get some maize? So we stopped at this store. That was flour. That's what they call flour, maize. So we bought several, you know, 20-pound uh, bags of flour and put them in the back of the, the vehicle and drove up to the compound and gave the widows bags and bags of flour. They were so grateful to have that. A lot of the food they eat in Kenya is grown naturally. They pick off trees and the plants and different things like that. But to have actual flour that they could bake with and cook with, they were thrilled. And I'll tell you what, when you hand a large bag of flour over those ladies, you would have thought you handed them a million dollars. They were so grateful for that flour. So we give them the flour. You know, over here, we don't think about things like that. But that's their very livelihood. That's their life, you know, and that's what they desire. Uh, just to be able to eat and survive. And uh, I taught there for several, several hours. And those ladies were amazing. Afterwards, they asked me all kinds of questions, and I was answering their questions. And, and then the one main head lady, uh, she's one that really knows the Bible really well, had some really good questions for me, so I answered those. And she was thrilled. They were all thrilled. You never saw a nicer bunch of ladies than those wil widow ladies. And many of them were young, many of them were old. They were all kind of ages, taking care of one another. So it was, it was kind of cool. They had a compound and little, little buildings where the widows stayed at and lived in. And uh, when I say a, a main building, dirt floor, clay walls, thatch for, for ceilings, that's, that's where they lived, or that's their main gathering hall. So you can't think of anything like we have here, a conference center and like that. They don't didn't have that there. But they were amazing, amazing gals. So Bishop Bryan called me and said that the, because of the coronavirus in Kenya, so much of the uh, uh, deliverance of food and all that kind of stuff is dried up and people aren't bringing food to them. And they had two widows die already of, of hunger. So uh, these are, some of these ladies are pretty old. And so I felt, well, i got to do something about this. That's when we started the Hunger Project and doing that hunger, hunger Project now. Open up your Bibles to Psalms 18. Last week we got up to Psalms 18. Or uh, Psalm, on Psalm 18 we got up to verse 16. So we're going to start at verse 16. Psalms 18. Verse 16. So. It said, this is, you know, Psalm of David, more than likely talking about fleeing from the hands of Saul. I mentioned this last week. Some theologians say that they figured maybe it's 20 years Saul was running from Saul. Or David was running from Saul. Not Paul, but David was running from Saul. <laughs> Got that mixed up because Saul is also Paul in the New Testament. <laughs> you know, Saul is the Hebrew way to say it. Paul is the Greek way to say it. But anyway... Uh, David, I, I had no idea David ran for 20 years. And I also found out that David was anointed to be king in Hebron 20 years before he actually became king. It's amazing how the patience that King David had, knowing he was anointed by the prophet Nathan uh, to be king, and he had to wait 20 years before he got his kingship. How many of you have prayed for God to give you something and waited 20 years to receive it? We're a little impatient here. We're fast food type people. Yeah. We want to be able to drive up and get it right away. But David waited 20 years to become king of Israel. And a good part of that 20 years, he was trying to be killed by Saul and Saul's army that was faithful to him. And many of the inhabitants of Israel that still liked Saul and hated David. That's tough. That's tough. And David never at once tried to take 
the kingship away from Saul. Not once, because the Lord told him not to. So we'll be talking about that scripture here in a moment. But uh, David would not lay a hand on Saul because David was obedient to the Lord. The Lord said, don't touch Saul. So David didn't. David could have said, what do you mean? I'm king, and, and he's still king. I should be there. By golly, I'm going to go kill him. That wasn't David's heart. David was a humble servant. And the Lord said to him, do not kill Saul. David wasn't going to. He knew sooner or later God was going to put him in the right position because he was already anointed by Nathan the prophet to be king. So David knew that. So he was patient. It's a good lesson for all of us to learn to be patient in things we have asked God for. Amen? That's why I've always said, you know, write your prayers down, your requests down, and then fold them up, put them on a piece of paper, and put them in your Bible somewhere. And maybe a year or two later, you run across it, and you open it, and go, oh, yeah, that was answered. This happened, and that happened. Quite often, we forget the answers we get from God. And so it's good to write them down so we remember at all time. All right, verse 16. He sent from above, and he took me, and he drew me out of many waters, David said. He sent from above. Uh, uh, this is talking about in the heavenlies. God did whatever he had to do to answer the, the delivered David. And he said, delivered him out of many waters. Most of the time when you're talking this way, waters means people. You see this even in the book of Revelation. The waters mean people. And so uh, David was delivered many times by people. God uses people. Do you know that God uses people? He prefers to use people. He could easily do it himself, but he prefers to use people because he wants to build faith in people and allow people to you know, grow in him also. He uses us. He uses it. Do you know God wants to use you? He wants to use you for his kingdom. Every one of us. Every one of us is part of the body. Every one of us is the temple of the Lord. Just like Paul said that nobody can brag and say, I'm the eye and you're just a finger. You know, whatever. He didn't quite say it that way, but that's what he meant. You know, we can't brag that we, we have a better part of the body. Because you can't live without a finger very well. You can't live without a toe very well. You can stumble around, but you can't live with those things very well. So... All the body must fit together and work together to accomplish the things that God wants us to accomplish for the kingdom. Every one of you are part of the body. Stop thinking about it. What part are you? Are you an ear? Are you a tooth? <laughs> are you just a fingernail? <laughs> what are you? But you're valuable. You know how hurt, much it hurts to even be missing a fingernail on your fingers. You're bumping it all the time and it hurts. So there's no part of the body that is not important. We must all function together as a body of the Lord. Verse 17. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hate me, for they were too strong for me. David relied on God. He knew these people were too strong for him. you got to remember the armies of Saul was trying to track him down. And then there are many people in the land of Israel telling Saul, I saw him go this way, I saw him go that way, I saw him hiding over here. Constantly tattling on David, where David had to run and run all the time. For 20 years, David had to run all the time. Unbelievable that he had to do those things. But God will watch after us. 1 Samuel 27, 1. David said, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. This is what he said. He, David thought he was going to perish. He got to the point and he says, he's going to get me. I can't survive this. He's going to get me. So what did David say after he said that? He says, so I think I'll head for the land of the Philistines, Israel's arch enemies. So David took up residence with the Philistines who received him and gave him a place to stay. Really? You know, because the Philistines hated Saul, too. And so they gave David a place to stay. You know, and of course, uh, God protected David all the time with the Philistines. I'm sure there are people there in the Phil land of the Philistines that wanted to kill David, too. But gave, God protected David there. And the Philistines gave him refuge. You know, sometimes our enemies give us refuge. 
You know that? Our enemies can give us refuge too if that's what God desires. So don't, don't ever, you know, mistaken because somebody doesn't think like you that they're not there to help you. You have to remember that. Sometimes people, God calls people to help you even though it, it help comes from strange places or strange people. But God does that sometimes. So David hid with the Philistines for, for a season until he, he left the Philistines. Verse uh, 18. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay or my support. The day of, that that calamity, you know, they had him surrounded. They had many times trying to uh, try to kill him. But the Lord prevented them from killing him. For the Lord was his protector and his sustenance and his support. That's what the word stay means. Verse 19. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me and because he delighted in me. That large place, other definition, that could be a broad, roomy, expanse, wide place. All right. So in other words, David was hiding in little narrow ravines and caves, but God brought him into a broad place. So when you're brought into a broad place, you are seen. People know you're there. And so David had enough trust in the Lord that he didn't ha always have to hide in caves. You know, uh, I remember the, uh, the, um, when they were smuggling Bibles into Eastern Europe, back when the communists controlled Eastern Europe. There was a man who smuggled Bibles in there all the time. And they asked him, how, how do you get away with that? Crossing those borders with hundreds of Bibles in your car. How do you get away with that without being arrested and, dis and uh, killed or thrown in prison? And he would say this prayer. He says, Lord, you made blind eyes see when you were on this earth. Now I'm asking you to make seeing eyes blind. And he went, he t I read his book, and his book was amazing how many people, how many times he smuggled Bibles across those borders in those communist Eastern European countries. And they, they would open up his trunk, and there's a trunk full of Bibles. And the guy, the guard would look around like this, like he can't see nothing, and close the trunk and move on. God did. God blinded his eyes because it was illegal to bring Bibles into those countries. And, uh, you know, they didn't even take them for the black market or anything like they did in China for a long time. And uh, so the God smuggler is what he was called, the God smuggler. And he brought tens of thousands of Bibles to Eastern Europe. And there's a man whose name is going to be written in the high points of heaven. He eventually was caught, eventually. And then he was let go, but, he, but they treated him very harshly in prison for a while. But there was a man so dedicated to God, he, he, he wasn't afraid of death or jail. He was going to do what God called him to do. What a, what a great man, the God smuggler. Because he delighted in me. I, I love that phrase. The Lord delights in me. So we have to ask the question, does the God delight in us? What must we do for God to delight in us? Do you not know that he dodes over us? Do you not know that he rejoices over us? What must we do for the Lord to delight in us? David said the Lord delights in him. Because David walked in his counsel. David had faith. David loved the Lord. David was obedient to God's word. Later in life, he made some serious mistakes. But God still loved David and rejoiced in him. But at this time, David did no wrong. He was a young man walking faithfully in the Lord all during this time. So the Lord delights in him. You must understand, God delights in you too. What does it take for God to delight in us? And I asked that question last week. We are to love the Lord God. What does it mean to love the Lord God? These are great questions we need to ask ourselves. Lord, how do, what must I do for you to, to delight in me? What must I do to show you I love you? These are things dealing with the kingdom. Kingdom concepts of God. Being obedient to his word. You know, and, and doing things for God. And operating in faith. You know, when you operate in faith and believe what God has said. And I don't mean just head knowledge. I mean heart knowledge. That you truly believe with your heart that the, what he said is going to happen. That's faith. It's impossible to please God without faith, the scripture says. 
You have to have faith. And when you have faith, you please God and he delights in it and he knows you love him when you believe in what he has said and you act on it. That's the important thing. What is belief? Even the devils believe. But they're going to be destroyed. That's a belief that you act on your belief by faith. And know that God's going to do that. Did David believe God that he was going to be made king someday? Do you think all 20 of those years that he never lost that faith? That's tough. There was a point there where he fled to the Philistines. But God blessed him. So God forgave him for that. I don't know if it was even a sin of lack of faith of David. Probably not. God blessed him to give David a rest for a while from running all over the countryside. So God used the enemies of Israel to bless David for a short period of time. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. The Lord delights in us. We must understand he delights in us. Verse 20. The Lord rewar rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. So David's saying right here after he said the Lord delights in me and he rewards me for my righteousness according to the cleanliness of my hands. He rewards me. Dear believers, do you not know that the Lord will reward you? I can't even count how many times I've talked about this subject of rewards in the kingdom of God. And I've talked to Many places. And, many, and, and, and believers will come up and say, I've never heard that before. I'm like, what? Do you not know the Lord wants to reward you in the kingdom? And I didn't understand why churches are not telling their people this. And they don't understand this. That our rewards are waiting there. Oh, but we're saved by grace, not by our works. Man, I just shake my head and say, you don't understand scriptures at all, do you? Your salvation is by grace. Your position in the kingdom rewards are by your deeds that you do. That's real clear in scriptures, but it's not being taught. Everybody just teach same, the same teaching. They make works sound like it's something evil. Oh, works. Oh, you're talking about works. Oh, my God. Ah, blah, blah, blah. You know, works are important after you are saved not before you are saved. Once, once you are saved and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are required to do works of God. That's in the scriptures, and it's in the New Testament that you're required to do works of righteousness and deeds of righteousness. It tells us that. Why is that ignored all the time? It cannot be ignored. It's everywhere in the Bible, but people handpick all the scriptures. It's important to teach scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and every word in between. By every word shall man live. Every word in between. So many believers are hurting out there because all they've been being taught is hand-picked scriptures. That's sad. That's really sad. I mean, if it isn't, you know, cheap grace concepts where they're saying, I can do anything I want, I go, oh, contraire. You cannot do whatever you want. Even Paul says, God forbid you do something like that. Well, Paul, you know, the one, the one person they mostly quote saying we can do anything we want now because of what Yeshua did for us. But Paul went on to say that, should I sin now to make grace abound? He says, God forbid. What's the matter with you guys? You can't do that. So you have to understand the difference between being saved by faith for salvation. But once you are saved, good deeds are required from you. If you don't do good deeds, you are not sanctifying the name of the Lord. When somebody sees you doing something bad out there, what do you think they're going to say? Oh yeah, he calls himself a believer. Yeah, right. You're not, that's not sanctifying the Lord. That's not sanctifying the Lord at all. And they mock you, and they mock God, and, you know, they, oh, yeah, he's just a hypocrite. Well, in one sense or another, we're all hypocrites in one sense. But we have to have faith and trust in God. Even a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. And, and, and John says, uh, I think it's 1 John says, 
Anyone who says they do not sin is a liar. We do sin. But God is watching our heart and our attitude. That's what's important. We're not perfect, but we desire him. We desire the kingdom. We desire to walk in his presence. So we make a mistake, a righteous man gets back up. Where you're in trouble is when you don't get back up. Oh, I'm tired of this. Just like Yeshua said, you cannot serve man and God at the same time. The word was actually mammon in the gospel. But you cannot serve mammon and God at the same time. For you will love one and despise the other. So when you keep sinning against God, you're going to get to a point somewhere where you're going to have to make a choice. Either God or the world. You cannot keep doing both. Oh, you can pretend to do both, and you can put on a mask that you're doing both, but really, internally in your heart, you cannot continue that. So sooner or later, you're going to either serve the world, or you're going to serve God, or one or the other is going to take over. And if the world takes over, you'll put on a mask that you're a believer, but you're not living it. You're not living it. And in some cases, people just begin to despise and hate God. Let it never be so that that happens to any of us. So, Rabbi, what are you saying? That a righteous man falls seven times and gets back up? What do we do? Get back up. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for strength in the Lord to help you get through and not commit the same sins again. That you can walk in righteousness. You ask God. People all the time you know, tell me, God, uh, uh, Rabbi, I've done this, I've done this, oh, I feel so bad. I said, okay, what are you doing about it? What do you mean? Are you expecting me to wave a magic wand and all of a sudden your conscience is cleared? Is that what you want me to do? That ain't going to happen. Not going to happen at all. The only way you get your conscience clear is through him. That is the only way to get your conscience clear. There's nothing new under the sun. You haven't done something others haven't done. Why do you think suddenly this is something new and you've lost your salvation and God is going to drop a, a boulder out of heaven and smash you like a bug or something? He doesn't want to do that. He loves you. He just wants you to come back. He wants you to come back. So when you make a mistake, confess it. Repent, which means to turn away from it and don't do it again. And God will, presence will be back in your life again. Many people have told me, I don't feel God anymore. I don't feel God in my life anymore. You know what I say when they tell me that? What did you do? <laughs> what did you do that's unpleasant before God? What did you do that God doesn't delight you in, in you anymore? Oh, I didn't do anything. Oh, no, no, don't tell me that. You did do something. You're not fooling me. You're trying to fool me and God. You're not, you're not fooling me. What did you do? Now that I say that, nobody ever going to want to talk to me again. But, <laughs> but that's true. Oh, my goal is to get you back in right standing with God. I don't care what you did. There's nothing new under the sun. Oh, Rabbi, you don't know the terrible things I've done. I don't want to know the terrible things you did. <laughs> but I can tell you this, that's nothing new. There's nothing new. The Bible talks about this stuff everywhere. Paul says there's nothing new. Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. So forget about what you did. You need to talk to him. Make it right with him. And he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, the scripture says. And he will forgive those sins. But if you try to walk the wall between the world and God, that's a very narrow wall. You're not going to stay balanced on it. You're going to fall to one side or the other. You're eventually going to slip or trip and go to one side, and you're going to decide it's too hard to climb back up the wall to the other side. And then you're, now you're in trouble. Now you're in trouble. 
Doesn't mean you're going to necessarily lose your salvation. But you're going to be in trouble with God. You're not going to have peace. He's not going to delight in you. These things are important. That we have to understand these things. In the resurrection, garments of light is probably the greatest reward that will be handed out to every believer. Garments of light. You'll be surprised how many people I've talked to go, I've never heard that before. And I'm going, <laughs> well, not my fault you don't read the scriptures. But garments of light. Some will shine like the luminaries, like the sun and the stars. Daniel says, and then some will be like shameful to look at. Doesn't mean you're going to be shamed. It's just saying in comparison to a 5-watt bulb, to a million watt bulb, the five watt bulb is shamed before the million watt bulb. That's what he's talking about. Garments of light. So the brightness of your light, of the garments of light you will receive, has everything to do with your good deeds in the Lord. And it has nothing to do with your salvation. That's after salvation. That's why the Hebrews, it was the grace and mercy of God to bring them out of Egypt and cross the Red Sea, which was their baptism, Paul says. They didn't earn that. God did that for them. But once they got to Mount Sinai, God now gave them instructions. And when they didn't follow those instructions, they were punished. And that's why Paul says everything that happened in the wilderness, the Hebrews in the wilderness, is for our example how to walk before God. Then you begin to see, once you've been delivered, and once you've been saved, you are called to righteous deeds. Or we don't sanctify the name of the Lord. God doesn't like to have his name unsanctified. God doesn't like to have his name cursed at because somebody saw what we were doing. God don't like that. Not at all. Wow. First Corinthians chapter 3 tells you you have a foundation in Christ Jesus. In Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, you have a foundation. What do you build upon that foundation? It says some build upon that foundation wood, hay, stubble. Others build upon it with gold, silver, and precious stones. God's not interested in gold, silver, and precious stones. It's an example of the things that are precious to God. God don't care about gold. He's talking about your righteous deeds. Because when you come before the judgment seat of the Messiah, fire will come down on your books of works. Yeah, we all have books of works. Do you know that? That you have books of work? Well, someday you stand before the Messiah at the Bema seat. You read that also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That, that Bema seat is going to be there. And your books of works are going to be presented. Everything, everything you ever did good and bad people freak out over that everything we've ever did is recorded good and bad well rabbi I thought Yeshua did away with our sins you're getting ahead of yourself it is going to happen but not yet all our works good and bad will be presented to us at the beam of seat of the Messiah the books will be open. Your life will flash before your eyes. Where do you think that phrase came from? Everything you ever said and did will be revealed. That's what the Bible says. All things will be revealed. Well, Rabbi, I don't want anybody to know certain things. Well, everybody else will be in the same boat. <laughs> everybody will be in the same boat. So what are you worried about? They're worried about their turn, not you. what's going on with you. And if anybody's not worried about that, they're probably over self-righteous anyway. And so they'll be faced with their, their, their sins in that way. Because it doesn't come with humility. We'll be talking more about humility here in a little bit. If we, get, if we have, if I have time. So anyway, all the works are going to be revealed. Then God will burn up your book. Some of you have a lot of books. Some of you have a few books. Whatever it is. God will burn it up. Actually, probably fire will come out of the mouth or eyes of Yeshua because you'll be standing before him. He will burn up your works. But the gold and silver and precious stones remain. Thus you shall have reward. 
But it says there, and particularly in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but if all your works are burned up, yet you still shall be saved because you had the foundation. That's why I believe in once saved, always saved. If you're truly saved. And you don't deny Yeshua. So once you become saved and you know it, when you get saved, God's spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are indeed a son and daughter of God, then you are saved. If God does not bear witness to that, you may have never been saved. You may be going through the motions and the acts, but you're not really saved. But if you are truly saved, that's the foundation you have laid. And what you build upon that foundation is very, very important. Well, what, what kind of work should we build on that, Rabbi? Let me give you two simple hints of the works you should do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything you do should be based on those two commandments. That's righteous works. I am not talking about dead works. Dead works get you nowhere. Especially works you think are going to please God that you're forming in your own head. Forget that. What did God tell you to do? You can't take a whip on Resurrection Sunday and whip yourself down the street over your back and draw blood and think you're doing something righteous. That is dead works. God never told you to whip yourself or the few crazy people in the Philippines that crucify themselves. God never told you to do stuff like that or to go up the steps of a cathedral until your knees are bloody when you're walking on your knees. God never called you to do something like that. That's all dead works. Or works we form in our own brain and mind, what we think would please God. We cannot do that. It's got to be a works that God has talked about in the Bible. Particularly the Ten Commandments. You know, four of the Ten Commandments are about loving God. Six of the Ten Commandments are about loving man. Then the rest of the laws that God gave just breaks those down even further detail. We're not talking about following the laws of the land of Israel. You don't live in Israel. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about the laws of, of the temple in Jerusalem. We don't have a temple in Jerusalem, and neither are you in Jerusalem. We're not talking about those kind of things. We're not talking about the laws that Israel, as a government, had to execute. We're not talking about those. Where do you think most of the laws of the United States came from? From the Bible. From the Bible. That's where they came from. But today lawlessness is trying to take over our country and they're trying to destroy the very foundation of our country which is destroying the foundation of the Bible because our country was based off of the Bible. We remove prayer out of school, we remove Bible out of school and everybody's offended when they see a Bible somewhere. Did you see how many people were offended with Trump just holding up the Bible at that church? Oh my gosh, you would have thought he said the worst and did the worst thing possible any man could ever say and do. When you lift the left, how they gnarled their teeth and, and gashed out terrible things about that. That's the way the wicked are. They hate God. And they despise the idea that Trump held up a Bible. The leader of the United States held up a Bible. God forbid, they think. I say, yeah, God allow. That's what I say. Over and over and over again. God allow. Man. Verse 21. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. So David said, I kept the ways. He resolved to overcome and keep the ways of God because he was not going to kill Saul. Because God said, do not touch Saul. So he wasn't going to hurt Saul. And David didn't do anything bad after that or before that besides that. Verse 22. For all his judgments were before me and did not put away his statutes before me. David did not put away the statutes of God before him, nor put away the laws of God before him. 
Folks, the church today is, even the church today is trying to destroy the laws of God. They're arguing with us all the time. I get it on emails, I get it phone calls. We even had a visitor last week that argued with us out in the lobby. Well, thank God for three men that stood up and let him know what the truth was. They stood up for God. I don't know what's wrong with that guy, but he was bound and determined he was going to come over and teach us a lesson during our service. And they stopped him out there. I came over here to teach you Jews something right, you know. But our, the three individuals stood up and started preaching the truth to him. I don't know if they convinced him, but he, he finally left. I'm sure he chewed on that for a while. The truth. He didn't have the truth. He did not have the truth. But to be that bold, bold and brazen that I'm coming over to that congregation during the service and I'm going to set them straight. If they hadn't stopped you out there, you might have come in here. Started yelling at me. He could try. <laughs> I'm not afraid of a fight. Never have been afraid of a fight. So, but I'm glad those, those three men stood up and confronted him and argued with him out there for I don't know how long they argued with him, probably 30 minutes out there. But I heard what some of the men said, what they said, and I said, Thank you, Lord. They understand. <laughs> Think they did a great job in confronting this guy. And so, what is our position? We have to confront, too. We can't allow, allow people to try to destroy the Word of God and teach lawlessness. The law is not gone. It's not gone at all. In Acts chapter 15, James, the brother of Yeshua, when they were arguing about circumcision, he was the first bishop of Jerusalem. James stood up, and he's also the author of the book in the Bible, book of James. He sort of says, this is my ruling. Because he was listening to Peter and Paul and others talk about this. But James was in charge. And James got him and said, this is what we will do with the Gentiles. We will not force them to be circumcised. Because we realize now that God has poured his Holy Spirit out on uncircumcised Gentiles. So if God wants to pour his Spirit out on uncircumcised Gentiles, what does circumcision of the flesh, flesh have to do with anything? So they realize that God was reaching out to the Gentiles, poured the Holy Spirit out where they were speaking in tongues and prophesying. At Cornelius' house, the Roman centurion, a Roman Gentile. When they just asked Peter about Jesus, what, tell us about this Jesus that was crucified. So Peter told them the gospel. And they believed. While Peter was talking, the Holy Spirit fell on this house. And they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. And Peter was like, whoa. You remember, Peter just had a dream about unclean animals. And he heard the voice of God said, eat. Peter, and he goes, oh, no, nothing like that's ever touched my lips. And then Peter finally realized what the dream was about. It wasn't about animals. It was about Gentiles when he spoke at Cornelius' house. So James said, we will not force Gentiles to be circumcised. But this we asked them to do. He gave them a few things to do. He said, do not eat blood. That was important. Do not eat blood. So James, you know, there's like three commandments in the Bible about not eating blood. James is telling the Gentiles, don't eat blood. Wow, you, you say that today, you're not allowed to eat blood. Oh, you're trying to put us back under the law. Well, you know, I think James knows what he's talking about. He said, don't eat blood. And he said, and, and avoid fornication. Well, what do you know about that? Don't ask me. I argue with God. First of all, you got to understand what fornication was. Fornication was not illicit sex. Even though God's against that, it's not what it was talking about. Fornication was the idea of receiving meat offered to idols. In the Roman days, they killed so many animals or sacrifices that the poor could go and get meat 
from the Romans. Because they had to do something with all these animals they kept killing. And to go to receive the, receive the meat, the Romans say, okay, this animal was sacrificed to, to uh, the Roman god Jupiter or whatever. See, so now you have to bow a knee to Jupiter to get the meat. So that kind of fornication was the, or the concept was that eating meat offered to idols was the concept. Even Apostle Paul said, if you sit down to eat with somebody and, they, and you're in the middle of a meal and they say, oh, that, that meat was offered to some Roman god, what did Paul say? It means nothing. Go ahead and eat. It means nothing. You're not doing it. You, know, you, you don't want to offend the family you're with because you're trying to reach them for Christ. That would be fine. But that's not what he's talking about. This is mean, I received this meat because I bowed a knee to Jupiter. It's idolatry. So basically what James was saying, avoid idolatry. That's the meat offered to idols. Fornication comes to the women gods that you had to go to the temple and commit fornication with the women in the temple to honor that Roman goddess. That's what that's talking about, the fornication meat offered to idols. So James is basically saying, avoid blood and stay away from idolatry. That's what he was talking about. But then he said something else right after that. We read this in Acts chapter 15. He said this. For they have a synagogue in every town. Let them go there and learn. So in other words, James told the Gentiles to go to the Jewish synagogues and learn Torah. Because they have Moses there. Anytime you do, they just speak of Moses like that, they're talking about the Torah. That's what the Torah is. First five books of, Moses, of the Bible of Moses. So James, the first bishop of Jerusalem, the brother of Yeshua, is telling Gentiles, go to the synagogues and learn the word of God. That's what he was, they were saying. Of course, after a while, there became a schism between, between the believers and the non-believers in the synagogues. And they had to split. And about that time, they started beginning to create their own assemblies. So it didn't stay. Because they just couldn't get along with one another. Particularly after the Bar Kokhba revolt. Because the, the, the Messianics did not help Israel fight Bar Kokhba. The false Jewish Messiah. To fight the Romans. And the Messianics said. They would, be, they would be willing to fight. But then they were told that they had to fly, fight under the banner of Akiva because he is the Messiah. And the believer says, he's not the Messiah, and we're not going to fight under his banner as long as you call him the Messiah. So the, the Rabbi Akiva, a non-believer rabbi, says, you will fight under the banner of Bar Kokhba or you won't fight. And so the Messianic said, then we won't fight. So Yeshua is our Messiah, not Bar Kokhba. And so they refused to fight. And there was over a million Jews killed in that battle. Most of the Messianics fled across the Jordan River in, into what we call today either Syria or Jordan. Fled over there to escape the carnage that was coming by Rome. That's why Yeshua said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, flee to the wilderness. And they remembered that. And they said, Yeshua said to run, we're going to run. And they did. And the Messianic survived. But many lost their lives. Because they followed a false Messiah. Bar Kokhba, the son of the morning, they called him. Rabbi Kiva said, he is the Messiah. There's no argument. He's the Messiah. And they would not listen to reason. And when, they, when the Messianics were trying to tell, tell them, no, no, we know who the Messiah is, and we know what he said was going to happen in the last days. Bar Kokhba is not the Messiah. You will serve under him, and you will fight under him. No, we won't. And so, so they fled. So, that's the way it works with God, his word. Yeshua is the only way. He is the only way to serve God. Verse 23, I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. 
He kept himself from his iniquity. It doesn't mean he didn't think bad thoughts, but he was going to keep himself from his iniquity. Verse 24, Therefore has the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. In other words, recompense, reward. So the Lord's going to reward David according to his righteousness. It's just what I said about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Lord's going to reward us according to our righteousness. Our, our, our good deeds that remain when everything else is burned up. And once those work, bad deeds are, are burned up, they're no longer remembered. That's why he says he throws them in the deepest ocean, removes them as far as east is from west. That's when it happens. There, before the behemoth seat of the Messiah, that's when it happens. Because once your bad works are burned up, and your, only your righteous works remain, then the Lord will wave you and present you before God the Father. What Shavuot is all about. You're now being presented to the Father. And the Father will accept anybody Yeshua presents to him. That's what that's about. But first, all, everything we ever did good and bad will be revealed. Why does he have to do that? So you understand all that he did for you. Most of us have forgotten the bad things we have done. But when all of a sudden all flashes before your eyes, you're going to go, oh my gosh. And then he's going to, fire is going to come down. He's going to burn up the bad works. And then give you rewards, your garments of light. Maybe a throne. Maybe a crown. Maybe jewels in the crown. Then he will give you that at that time. And no more will be remembered any of the bad works we've ever done. That's when it's taken away. But like I said earlier, if anyone suffers loss, in other words, nothing remained from the fire, yet they shall be saved. They may be saved, but they have nothing to show for it. And they'll probably remain what I call an outer court believer and not enter into the inner court presence of God at all. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about outer darkness. Outer darkness is not hell. Outer darkness is away from the presence of God. So you move further into the outer court. You're saved. You're not going to be destroyed or suffer in the fires of hell. You're saved. But you do not have the right to stand before the Father. Folks, there's a lot to this stuff. And it's silly what churches are teaching people today. There's going to be a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth come that day. All you have to do is look at the parables and you see that. Look at the parables. The men with the talents. You know, the, the one talent, the two talents, the five talents. The five talent. These are things that God had given these. They're all called servants. All three called servants. That the master, which is talking about Yeshua, gave these three guys. And some people interpret that talents as gifts or abilities or whatever. So one guy had one talent. He hid it because he, he was afraid. The man with the two talents went and invested it and got two more talents. The man with the five talents went and invested his and got five more talents. So when the master came back, said, present, present your works before me. To the guy with the five talents, says, Master, I invested the things you gave me, and I doubled it. Here it is. Well done, my faithful servant. Enter into my kingdom. The one with the two talents came back and said, Master, I took these and doubled it. Well done, my faithful servant. Enter into my kingdom. The one with the one talent says, Lord, here's your one talent back. I hid it because I knew you were a hard man. You wicked servant. Throw him out into outer darkness. He was a servant. God gave him talents. He didn't deserve to go to hell. It wasn't, you know, he was already saved. That's what that, the whole concept of that parable about is about. He's already saved, but he had nothing to show for his salvation. So the, the master removed him from his presence into outer darkness. He didn't deserve to be in his presence. There's consequences. 
There's always consequences. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything we do should be based on those two commandments. It doesn't say, it doesn't say to love me with all my heart, all my soul, and all my talent. And not don't mean me personally, but you know, talking about ourselves. <laughs> Got to clarify that. It's not about loving ourselves. It's about loving God and others. That's what it's about. That's why we must do these things. Amen? All right. Let's get our offerings ready.